Welcome to Flock Talk, Flock Talk, the podcast where we feature your favorite authors and narrators. Hosted by Craig Hart and Sarah Hannon. Visit us today at pinkflamingoproductions.com. And now, Flock Talk. Hello, all you happy flockers out there, and welcome to Flock Talk. My name is Craig Hart, and I am here with my courageous co host, Sarah Hannon. How are you doing today, Sarah? Well, Craig, my feet are cold, but otherwise I'm good. I'm so sorry <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> Socks, boots, slippers. There are solutions to this. I know. I am barefoot in my booth and my feet are cold, but I'm happy to be here. You're barefoot in your... Okay. Well, that explains... I I don't like socks. I don't like shoes, so... (laughs) Yes. Well, if you're like me, you solve a problem, then you have nothing to complain about. (laughs) What I really want to do is complain about the problem, so... No, good. I'm glad to hear that nothing else terrible is awry. I guess cold feet is unpleasant enough, but there could be worse things, I suppose. I'm going to make it through this. Well, here's something to to make you feel better. We have a great guest today. C.A. McConey is here with us. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. C.A. McConey began reading at the age of five and has never stopped. Her childhood was filled with multiple readings of Gone with the Wind, the ultimate tragic novel. Connie got her own happily ever after when she married her retired military hero, Gary, in 2010. She began her author services company, Lucky 13, in 2015, specializing in editing, proofreading, promoting, social media management, and administrative support. Connie also hosts and sponsors author and reader events, never dreaming she would one day attend events as a signing author. When she's not reading, writing, or working with authors, she enjoys traveling, spending time with her grandchildren, boating, motorcycling, and cheering on her beloved Baltimore Ravens. Thank you. So great to have you here. Now, C.A. McConey, do you mind if we call you Connie? Oh, Connie is is great. <laughs> right. So, Connie, what made you start writing in the first place? What gave you that that bug? Well, I never thought I would uh, or never thought I had the talent to be a fiction writer. I did a lot of technical writing and policy writing uh, over the years uh, in my former career. I'm now retired from a J job. And uh, the more I worked with authors and definitely enjoyed reading romance, and then I began editing and proofreading and thought, uh, maybe I could give this a try. And so I have a, a little funny story about how I actually did take the plunge. Um, I was afraid to do it on my own. So one of uh, the authors who's very talented that I edited for, her name is J.B. Havens, uh, she had an idea for a story and uh, romance isn't her favorite thing to write. So she thought she might seek out a a co-writer. And uh, I said, well, uh, maybe I could co-write it with you. And she, she agreed. And the funny thing was about a month before she approached me with that, I went to New Orleans. And as many people in New Orleans do, I went and saw a fortune teller. And she told me that I was was a writer and going to be a writer. And I told her that surely she wasn't a very good fortune teller because that was never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and then a little bit, uh, not too long after that, uh, is when I actually uh, did uh, embark on that. So it was pretty cool. Did you ever uh, follow you... up with the fortune teller and let her know? Uh, I've been back to New Orleans. <laughs> actually, uh, my next trip after that to New Orleans was for an author signing, one of the, the first uh, author signings that I attended. And uh, I didn't know where she was, so I did not go back and see her. <laughs> Well, maybe she took your advice. You're like, you know, I should get out of the fortune telling business after all. I'm just, she was right. And she became all. a writer. <laughs> <laughs> she became. A writer. <laughs> well, at the very least, maybe you can put her as a character in one of your books. Yeah, that would that would be a cool thing to do. <laughs> Speaking of, how do you go about creating your characters? Well, uh, the first book was envisioned to become a series, and uh, it. Uh, featured uh, a small town. So I decided to model that small town after the small town that I grew up in, a suburb of Richmond, Virginia. And uh, this fictional small town is actually in Mississippi, and I had never been there. So I just uh, 
kind of imagined some things and then, like I said, modeled a lot of things after the, the town that I was familiar with. And then after that first book, it just seemed to sort of naturally flow after that. I thought of other people and other things in the town to do. And so I've kind of created this, uh, this little world of this small town in Mississippi. Very cool. Talk about the writing process. What do you find easiest about the writing process? And one thing that perhaps you find the most difficult. <laughs> the, the most difficult thing is to actually do the writing, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> For me, anyway. Uh, you know, a lot of authors talk about those voices in their heads and, you know, the characters tell them what to do and all that stuff. I think that's hogwash. That does not happen to me at all. I have, have no visions. So it's a very practical and... Uh, thought out process for me. So I am a plotter. And when I have my initial idea for characters and uh, maybe, you know, what their professions are or how they fit into the small town, I then actually outline chapter by chapter. Uh, Sometimes I get someone to help me do that. And then other times I have the idea myself, but I actually, uh, before any writing occurs, I have a chapter by chapter outline and then I essentially fill it in. And I actually, for me, the ending of the book is easier to write than the beginning. What are some things that have surprised you about the publishing part of the process? Um, well, I got in, uh, I, I started reading ebooks in about 2015. And at that time, it, you know, was a wide open field. Um, and uh, I discovered how, you know, you could download these books on a Kindle and read them and how easy and portable and everything it was. Um, But I also quickly saw a lot of uh, mistakes and errors in books, uh, especially the self-published or indie books. So I saw very quickly a possible new career for myself, and that was in editing and proofreading. So that's how I started out as something to do after I retired from my day job. Um, and it just, uh, at that time, the, like I said, the field was pretty wide open and now, um, people have figured out that anybody can self-publish and upload a book to Amazon or wherever, right? So the market is becoming very saturated and it's, uh, very difficult to sort of get yourself seen out of this ocean of so many self-published books. So marketing is key uh, for many authors and writers, because I guess at at the heart, a writer is an artist. And so uh, many of them are less comfortable with the more uh, administrative uh, tasks uh, that come with being an author. And fortunately for me, I had some experience in that. So uh, it might be easier for me uh, than others to market and, uh, you know, get yourself out there and do social media and all of those other things. Um, It is a little easier for me, but still with the volume of people that are out there, it's very challenging to get yourself seen ahead of others. Uh, Do you have any any advice for authors who are beginning to think about putting their work out there, things they should look for prior to doing that? Oh, I guess some way to, to know that they're ready. Yeah, I would say, you know, really uh, focus on craft, uh, find those workshops and um, and uh, books that uh, talk about craft and help you to to enhance your craft. Uh, And then also uh, think about the things that you're going to have to do. Uh, to publish and actually be seen. Uh, Don't fall for the vanity publishers. Um, If you're going to self-publish, you're truly going to do it yourself and have total control of your book. Um, You know, you know what's best uh, to, you know, to do with your book. And I think that the two things that uh, people really need to focus on prior to hitting the publish button are finding a good editor having a great competitive cover 
that looks professional and uh, can help you stand out among all of those books, because that's the first thing that people are going to see is the cover. So um, it's really hard when people are starting out and they don't have a lot of money to publish. So um, it's, it's very difficult, but do as much as you can to find the money to get a quality edit and a quality cover. Do you ever read your book reviews? And if so, how do you deal with good or bad reviews? Oh, they tell us we never should, (laughs) right? Um, But I I confess that I do. Um, And I just try to, you know, of course, the the good ones make me happy. Um, And the bad ones, uh, you know, not so much. But Uh, We all know that some of us say that we know we've made it as an author when we get our first one star review. Right. So you kind of (laughs) just have to take it like that. And, you know, some I know some people try to analyze them and maybe they even like want to defend, you know, what the person said or whatever. But, you know, it's it's don't get caught in that trap. Just, you know, just over, you know, move on and and call it a day, because at the end of the end of everything the average is what's going to show at the top you know by the title right right i've seen on goodreads um somebody will leave a bad review and i have seen authors reply you know it's like and it's just not a good look (laughs) no um what some are complaining about now is that even on amazon you can just leave a number review and you don't have to write anything and so that you know that's not real helpful for us because we don't really know why the person loved it or hated it. And, you know, some people go along and just click, click, click and leave a bunch of one stars. Um, But uh, I haven't had, like, I haven't been devastated by it. So, you know, as long as I'm sort of, you know, averaging on the higher side, I'm good with that. Yeah. Someone told me as a narrator, you know, just to not read the reviews. And I was like, well, how am I going to, to, you know, determine my own (laughs) (laughs) self-worth? Well, speaking of that, I love I love the audio book reviews because, you know, they review the narrators as well as the story. So it's it's really cool. Yeah. Do you ever go back and read any of your own work cover to cover after it's been published, if, if it's a month, a year, multiple years? Out? Yeah, I have because I needed to, I decided to uh, change the name of my series. And so I had to do some updating uh, to do that. And so, um, and then I forget stuff, right? So sometimes I have to go back and check one of the other books to make sure it doesn't conflict with something, you know, I'm doing in the current book. So I do, uh, enjoy, uh, going back from time to time, you know, sometimes I cringe and say, oh, you know, I could have really done that part better. And then other times I'm pleasantly surprised by like, oh, did I really write that? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, like I wrote that. I'm good. <laughs> what do you think you think is a like, common myth about your about your job? Oh, probably the most common one is, you know, that authors are famous, right? Because, you know, especially self-pubbed, we're all sort of ordinary people. Most still have day jobs. It's, you know, very difficult to reach a level of success where, you know, you could make it a full-time job. Um, I won't ever have to face that dilemma, fortunately, because I'm retired from my day job and this is just the sort of post-retirement gig. So as long as it's fun, I'll keep doing it. It's a good way to travel. So I love to go to book signings and conferences and events. So um, it's all working really well. Um, about a month ago, I was flying back from DC uh, where my daughter and my grandkids are. And there were, I was on the aisle and there were a mother and daughter sitting in the same row with me and they were both reading books uh, the whole time of the flight. And I was on my computer, I was doing some writing. And then I don't know what caused the, the mother was the one uh, next to me in the middle seat. I don't know what caused her to ask, but she said, oh, should I know who you are? (laughs) And I said, no, (laughs) there's no reason for you to know who I am. (laughs) Well, absolutely you should. And here's an entire list of the catalog of my books. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I, you know, I should have put the marketing hat on real quick and said, oh, yeah, here's my 30 minute commercial. You can here's where you can find my book. But we were getting ready to deplane and everybody was ready to go. So 
we just kind of laughed about it. What is something about you that people might find surprising? Like about you personally? Hmm. I don't know. Um, in the past, some people have been surprised that my husband and I are motorcycle riders. I have, have my own bike and have been riding for about 15 years. Um, I recently took up golf, so that's kind of weird because I always thought that was just some boring thing that stuffy people did, right? But it's actually a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. Do you ever go up to Bike Week in New Hampshire? Uh, no, not New Hampshire. So for me, because I spent uh, most of my adult life in the D.C., Baltimore area. So Ocean City, Maryland was the Bike Week place to go. And then also uh, Daytona in Florida, where I live now. All right. Let's finish us up the main body of questions. We have a round of bonus questions that you can answer. Just first thing off the top of your head. Buckle up, listeners. It's time for Hot Six. Um, first one is, what is the most overrated book you've ever read? Probably Fifty Shades of Grey, and I think most romance authors will say that. <laughs> I mean, it was enjoyable, and the movies were enjoyable to me, but, it, you know, it's not, you know, uh, quality literary fiction, I guess. What famous literary work have you never read, but you feel like you should have? You know, I don't remember reading To Kill a Mockingbird. I don't know why. I guess I was so stuck on Gone with the Wind that, you know, I couldn't see anything else. <laughs> if you could be any animal for one day, what would it be? Probably a cat. Like a house cat? Uh, yeah, I have uh, a couple of cats and they're very sort of pampered and spoiled. And I think they have a good time. And my husband overfeeds them. Yeah, I saw a thing where the other day was some sort of meme, I guess, and it was about a, a dog in this case. And the woman who was posting it said, my husband came in and was saw the dog and was like, oh, what a great dog. You're such a good girl. And pets and kisses on the head. And she's like, I was sitting right next to the dog. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> That's how it is at our house, pretty much. Now, this one should be relatively easy considering you're editing, although I might be presuming a lot. What is your biggest grammatical pet peeve? I am an Oxford comma snob, and I cringe when people do not use the Oxford comma. Yeah, I love the Oxford comma. Excellent. Sarah and I are both <laughs> fans of the Oxford comma, so. <laughs> it was the first question we asked each other when we were going to team up on this podcast. <laughs> it's, a, it's a deal breaker, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. It should be on dating profiles everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, looking back over your entire lifetime, what is your most embarrassing favorite song? Oh, embarrassing favorite. Well, I can't think of an embarrassing favorite. I grew up on old school funk and I still love the classics. And, uh, Every time I'm at a place where there's a DJ, like a, you know, a party or something like that, I beg them to play Flashlight by Parliament Funkadelic. So that's probably my, my go-to. And then I probably act a little crazy. I happen to know someone. <laughs> I happen to know someone who plays with George Clinton now. Oh, wow. Yeah, my best friend follows the band. And when we were in the book signing New Orleans, when we were on the book signing New Orleans trip last October... Uh, George Clinton was showcasing his art in an art gallery. So we went to the gallery, um, saw his work, and got to talk to him for a few minutes. So that was pretty a pretty cool side thing that had nothing to do with the book signing. That is super cool. All right, last one. What one book do you wish you had written? And is it Gone with the Wind? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Yes, I'm, I was. I grew up a Southern girl, so it would have to be Gone with the Wind. Perfect. Awesome. All right, that wraps up our questions. Thank you, Connie, for doing this. Really appreciate your time. Oh, it was my pleasure. Uh, I love being a part of Pink Flamingo. Uh, I, th I think I was maybe among the first uh, authors that trust, entrusted my audiobooks to them, and uh, we're getting ready to do a few more. So... Uh, you know, flamingos rock. What can I say? You've been listening to Flock Talk, the podcast where we feature your favorite authors and narrators. 
hosted by Craig Hart and Sarah Hannon. This podcast is produced by Pink Flamingo Productions. Pink Flamingo Productions. Editing by Craig Hart. Visit us today at pinkflamingoproductions.com. Pink Flamingo.